Good morning and welcome to this meeting on the Committee of the Revision of the Penal Code. I'm Mike Romano, Committee Chair. We're going to wait a few minutes here to make sure that all the participants can get into the webinar room. It's good to see everybody. Thanks for joining us again. All right, let's get started. Uh, we'll begin with a roll call of committee members in alphabetical order. Assemblyman Brian is not here. Uh, I think just... uh, he, he's en route, I've been told, Mike. Sorry to interrupt, but I think okay. he'll be here I'll, momentarily. He'll join us <laughs> shortly. Thank you. Uh, Judge Espinoza. I'm here. Justice Moreno. Here. Senator Skinner. Hi. All right. Thank you all for being here. Um, look forward to our conversation today. We have a busy agenda as usual. We'll be focusing today on prosecutorial discretion and plea bargaining. We have eight excellent experts who will be joining us as witnesses in the panels that come. Uh, we'll have a brief presentation from Tom, uh, the committee's legal director, to set the stage for the issues that we'll be discussing today. Then we'll be hearing from our witnesses. After the witness panel panels, staff will give us an update about pending legislation. Uh, that we recommended and California crime rates. We'll then discuss proposals related to the topics today and also hear updates on our proposals that we've been discussing throughout the year. And of course, we'll take a look, few breaks along the way, including lunch, and then conclude with um, public comment. So uh, today's topic is a big one, prosecutorial discretion, charging and plea bargaining. This is an issue that is the core of the criminal legal system in California and around the country. To give some perspective, consider this. 97% of felony cases that go to trial result in guilty pleas, meaning that no trial occurred. Of course, that's only part of the story. Last year, California law enforcement made over 250,000 arrests for felony offenses, but fewer than one quarter of those cases resulted in felony convictions. In fact, felonies make up only one third of all criminal convictions in California. A significant explanation for how we get those numbers is in how prosecutors charge and resolve cases. These topics have been difficult for policymakers to address because so little law applies in this area. But what cases end up in court and what happens to a case in court have important consequences for public safety and equity. And there are also considerable financial concerns here. Even though our current prison population is lower than it has been in many years, we still spend more than $13 billion a year on California's prison and parole system. And that doesn't count the cost of local jails, courts, or law enforcement. My hope is today that we explore how data and experience can help prosecutors make the best decisions possible and execute in exercising their discretion. As always, the goal for our recommendations is to improve public safety while reducing unnecessary incarceration and improving equity, and particularly for this topic, making sure that every good dollar counts that we spend on incarceration is truly necessary. With that said, let's get started. Um, welcome, Assemblymember Brian. It's good to see you as always. So we're we're in full effect here. Great. Um, we're going to. We're going to start today uh, with a presentation from Tom, giving us some California specific data on these topics and setting the stage for the panelists. Uh, Tom, let's get started. You're on mute. Okay, good morning, everybody. Um, so yeah, so we thought we'd start today um, with a little bit of California specific data and some context and a bit of an overview of what we hope to cover today, because uh, you know, it's quite a, a big subject, to, I think, to get everyone's hands around. So if you've read the memo, a lot of this will look familiar, and hopefully this will just give us sort of a, a shared context. Um, so I first want to uh, talk about, um, you know, what happens with felony arrests. As, as Mike mentioned, only sort of a, 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 a fraction of them end up in convictions. And what this graphic here shows is more specifically um, how some cases get sort of kicked out of the system along the way. So this is just felony arrests, and this is just last year. So it's just... Um, one year of data, but I think, you know, we look back a little bit and it was sort of, I think, indicative of, of overall trends in the last few years. 
So what we see here is that, you know, around 20% of felony arrests are rejected by prosecutors in the first instance, uh, typically because they, they think there isn't uh, enough evidence to bring the case, but there may be lots of other reasons. So already that's, you know, about one fifth of arrests are just kicked out. And it does vary a little bit by the type of offense. As you can see, the top line here is all categories of offense. And we do violent property, drug and other. Um, and then another 20% of cases, even uh, of, of the arrests are kicked out of court once they get there, either through a dismissal or an acquittal, though, of course, it's mostly dismissals. And then we sort of see 60% result in a conviction of some kind. Um, and I think what's really notable here is that the violent uh, offense rejection rate is almost double what it is for the other offenses. So you do see a lot of variation even among offenses, but still overall, those trends are, are pretty big that only about 60% of arrests end up in a conviction. And not all is a felony conviction, which we'll show in a minute. So we're seeing sort of a big filter happening here even before cases get into court. And I think the question is, you know, what uh, what goes into that filter? Or what are the sort of the decisions that are made? And some of the panelists today will discuss that. And obviously, feel free to inter interrupt me with questions at any point along the way during this. I know you all know that, but I thought I'd mention it. Um, so that's sort of what happens at the arrest level. And this graphic here is about filings in court. So those cases that are accepted for prosecution, um, how do they show up in court? And what we look at here is at the county level, um, what percentage of criminal filings are felony, misdemeanor, or infraction? And obviously felonies are the most serious, misdemeanors are, are le less serious, and infractions are you know, the least serious by far. And we see um, you know, tremendous county variation. So the, the counties that are here are sort of the... Um, ones that have the most uh, percentage of felony cases down to the, to the lowest. And we see, you know, from Lassen County, which is 64% felonies, uh, down to some of these other counties like Orange, Orange and Ventura, which only about 20% in their caseload. Now, some of this can be explained by, you know, if there's more violent crime in the county, there's more likely to be more felony caseloads. But I don't think that's the entire explanation. And of course, a lot of this is also how wobblers are treated, those offenses that could be charged either as a felony or a misdemeanor. And some data that we got from uh, uh, eight reports that the ACLU had put out that's in the staff memo here shows that in some counties, wobblers are always charged as felonies and never as misdemeanors. And the, but that, that can change um, over time a little bit, too. So you see a tremendous amount of variation and, you know, the level of seriousness of cases that prosecutors are bringing across the state. Um, and then what so what happens at the output? Of the process so we've sort of seen what goes in at the arrest level what goes in at the charging level and this chart here shows us how these felony filings resolve and we look at four things really three it's technically four but and i'll explain why i say it's three so we look at you know how many felony filings in the county end up as a felony conviction how many end up as a misdemeanor conviction how many are dismissed and then how many end up in an acquittal and you can see there's the acquittals barely even show up on the chart because they're so small. It's that little smudge of blue that you can see at the end in some counties. Uh, and again, the issue here, I think, is tremendous county variation. You know, in some counties, you're very likely to end up with a felony conviction if you start with a felony charge. In other counties, you know, there's a significant role that uh, misdemeanor convictions play where up to a fifth of felony convictions end up as a as a misdemeanor. And I think really the thing that surprised me the most and, and uh, Rick and Joy when we looked at this was just how big a role that dismissals are playing. You know, you see in some counties, half of felony filings uh, are, end up being dismissed. So again, there's another filter coming in here, you know, cases that are kicked out of court. And I think um, the for me, this sort of brings up two conclusions, which are, you know, again, how are the decisions that are made to get these cases in court in the first place? What's happening when they're dismissed? And why are so many cases dismissed? Uh, why are they sort of brought in the first place? Why are so many ending up as misdemeanors uh, if they're charged as felonies in the first place? Uh, and, you know, I think there's lots of explanations for that, but it sort of suggests there's a lot of play in the joints here to some degree. Tom, I have a question on why LA, San Diego, and San Francisco are not reflected in this chart. Well, they didn't report data, so we, we weren't able to, to speak to it. So, um, you know, uh, that's the short answer. <laughs> so we, and we tried to pick the sort of counties that did report and were sort of, um, you know, representative of the, of, the, of the different approaches across the state. And I think right. they will start reporting soon, but in the most recent report from the Judicial Council, they're not there, unfortunately. Okay. Do, do you have any guess as to how those figures might be? I wouldn't want to hazard that because I was so surprised that there w was so much variation in the, in the places that, that did report. 
um, you know, I suspect in those bigger counties, a lot of cases end up as as misdemeanors, and there are a yeah. lot of dismissals. I don't think we'd see anything that is would sort of rethink what we see here. They're probably okay. in the middle a little bit. All right. But again, that's a guess. And just to make sure I'm reading this right, in the Alameda County, it looks like these are felony arrests. Sixty percent end up in felony convictions. Thirty nine percent are missed in are dismissed, and almost zero end up in misdemeanor convictions. That's right. There, it's it's felony filing, so it's the sort of the step after mm -hmm. arrest, but same after idea. Arrest. And again, you know, this is one year of, of data, so maybe there was something funky uh, in the in this year of data, but it seemed relevant to look at. And we did talk with folks at the Judicial Council to make sure we were sort of understanding what were in the numbers and how reliable they were. And um, that's what led us to uh, present this. But yeah, you know, you can see that's the story in Alameda, but that's sort of a unusual um, array of the data there. I think right. most places have, yeah. Looking at it. But no, like you're reading it exactly right. All right. So that sort of is the inputs and the outputs of the system. Now I want to shift to sort of what's going on along the way, you know, sort of what is the machinery that's happening in court that um, is uh, leading to some of these results. And that's what these next two and the final graphics uh, that I want to look at talk about. And that's sort of what is the process that is used to arrive at a disposition in these felony cases. And again, we're seeing a big role for dismissals. That's the red, as it was in the previous charts. Uh, and we're also seeing what role guilty pleas and trials play in getting these um, either a conviction or a dismissal. So in some counties, um, you know, Riverside has a 91 percent uh, of all dispositions and felony um, filings, 91 percent are guilty pleas, only six are dismissed. And again, you see a little pop of color with, with the trials in there and sort of not really part of the story. Um, but again, you see a lot of dismissals um, and felonies filings, but obviously the dominant thing here is guilty pleas. And I want to show a similar chart for the misdemeanor context, which shows an even bigger role for dismissals. Um, but a lot of guilty pleas, you know, as, as you said, Mike, it really is a, a story of guilty pleas. But I think what's often left out is just how many cases are sort of thrown out even once they're in court. And that's, you know, different reasons. It might be defense counsel plays a role, something happens with the case, there's diversion, um, but we are seeing dismissals really significant, um, especially in misdemeanors. Um, hey, hey, Tom, is, yeah. is there any disaggregation between dismissal or diversion, or is there any reason for us to believe that it, it's more dismissal than diversion? The, there is not that disaggregation, unfortunately. They're all, they're all treated together as just a dismissal or diversion. Um, and, you know, I would guess more dismissal than diversion because we, especially given what courts we're looking at here, a lot of them don't even have diversion courts. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I would prefer dismissals because that implies that there was some sort of you know error in the charging or evidence to begin with. But just want to make sure that this isn't the result of some sort of good infrastructure that's been created. Right. No, I, I don't think we can say for certain, but I think you're right, Senator Skinner, that it's probably heavily weighted towards dismissals, which might be the result of a good infrastructure, too. I think that's a, a really good um, sort of frame to to think about it. Um, uh, it would be great to have that diversion data and sort of see what cases they are, who's diverted and, and all that. So um, maybe one day. <laughs> um and so what the panelists are going to talk about today uh, for our first two panels, we're going to hear from uh, researchers who've looked at the use of prosecutorial discretion. Um, they're going to look, tell us a little bit about research has shown about what goes into some of this decision making, particularly on the charging side and a survey of, of, you know, hundreds of prosecutors given identical facts. There was a survey done of how would you charge it and why and just really um, kind of a surprising range of answers that were given there. We're going to hear a little bit about how even making the same decisions in a more efficient way can uh, lead to, um, you know, less incarceration, I think, improve public safety. And then we're also going to hear, I think, some very exciting research that's starting to develop over the last few years about what happens if you use your discretion uh, to have less prosecution. And it turns out there's some pretty um, compelling indications that that is better for public safety and other outcomes. That'll be our first panel, which we'll get to in a few minutes. Uh, and then our second panel is going to focus on the guilty plea process and I think tell us things that um, are very familiar uh, about some of the well-known issues of the guilty plea process, about some of the things that uh, seem to unfairly pressure people into pleading guilty, particularly around the uncertainty of what will happen after a trial and the sentence. We'll hear a little bit 
about that and some other issues. And also the role that pretrial incarceration plays, just the tremendous pressure that people feel to plead guilty if the result is they can walk out of jail that day or very soon after. So we're gonna hear a little research about that um, that's taking place in California. So that'll take us through our first two panels. Then our third panel today is gonna be about um, you know, some solutions and a little bit of policy history in California. You know, what has what have California tried to sort of shape its discretion in a way that um, seems to advance some of the goals that Mike spoke about earlier and, and wasn't what hasn't worked. So we're mostly going to focus on what has worked. Uh, so I want to just talk briefly about one of the things that didn't work, which was uh, Prop 8, 1982, the, the Victims' Bill of Rights uh, ballot initiative, as it was called. And it um, purported to end plea bargaining in serious felony cases, which at that time were estimated to be about a 25% of all felony arrests. Then the Department of Justice did a report in 1986 that concluded uh, it had no effect, <laughs> basically. And we talked to practitioners as well, so that is still the case. And in fact, they concluded here, and I highlighted some of the text because we thought it was so compelling, uh, that it's almost impossible to sharply limit the discretion available to legal actors and rather than eliminating plea bargaining, it just moved discretionary practices to a different point in the system. So try as it wanted to, you weren't able to squelch the discretion. It just sort of came out in other places. But they concluded that did it end plea bargaining in serious felony cases? Definitely not. You don't usually see that in, in research, unequivocally no. So it was a pretty strong finding. Uh, but the things we are going to hear about that did work, and this is going to be our third panel, which I think will be after lunch, is going to be about this history of financial incentives in California, particularly in the juvenile prison context in the late 90s, and then the probation revocation context in the um, early part of this century and realignment a little bit, and then a proposal to sort of build on those um, experiences and perhaps expand it in the adult prison context so we can use this discretion a little bit better. Um, so that's my presentation. That's you know a bit of data to give us a, some grounding, uh, and obviously a lot of questions. You know, every time we look at data, it always raises questions we don't know the answer to. But I think this was um, uh, you know sort of a helpful context for you all this morning, a little bit overview of the panels to sort of set the stage a little bit. So um, if there aren't any other questions, we could jump into the panels. Mike, what do you what do you prefer? I think we're good. Okay, great. Here? Sorry, what would you say? Is everybody here? The panelists. Yeah, they're all ready to go. I'll start promoting people. All right, great. All right, good morning, everyone. Um, I know that you've spoken to staff uh, ahead of these, uh, ahead of our meeting, but I just want to reiterate that we really appreciate, first of all, your time and your insight and your input. Um, and we're really hoping that you can help us go move towards really concrete, practical solutions to some really complicated problems. Um, I want to thank uh, each of you for joining us today. You'll have five to seven minutes to make opening remarks, and then we'll move to uh, question and answer, which I think is often the most productive time of our conversation. For panelists, for this panel and for all of our other panels, please know that if you've given us a written submission, we've read it. So in your opening remarks, please quickly move to the high points at Google so we can move on to the conversation, which, as I said, is really the most important part of our, um, of our meeting. So this first panel, are focusing on how prosecutors use their discretion when making charging decisions. Our panelists are, and I apologize for uh, mispronouncing names, so please correct me once you're on, um, Shima uh, Baradron Bowman, is that close? Okay, uh, is a professor of law at Brigham, Home, Brigham Young Law School. Alex uh, Cholas Wood, who's the executive director of Stanford Computational Policy Lab and Jennifer Doliak, who's the Executive Vice President of Criminal Justice at Arnold Ventures. Uh, Professor Badra, Baradron Bowman, please, first of all, please tell me how to pronounce your name correctly, and then uh, you can kick it off. Sure, it's no problem. It's she, uh, Baradron Bowman. It's a handful. It's a mouthful, so no worries. That's, but that's no excuse for me. I'm <laughs> um, that's okay. All right, so um, please begin with five minutes. Great. Yes. Uh, just a very, very quick background. I've been teaching law for about 15 years. I have been doing a lot of empirical research uh, on bail, prosecutors, drugs, crime. That's kind of my my go-to background. Uh, what I wanted to tell you about briefly is a, 
uh, experiment that we did nationally. So as was mentioned in the earlier comments, there's not a lot of data that exists about prosecutors and especially how they make charging decisions. So what we did was create a national, uh, what we call a field experiment, where we looked at how prosecutors make decisions in their charging. And so what, what we did was create false, but you know, very realistic looking incident report. And uh, we, pro we provided the prosecutors with a crime that could be a felony or a misdemeanor, depending on how you looked at it, right? And we wanted to see lots of things. So one of the things we looked at was race, uh, whether there was racial bias in, in the charging. So you know, one of the prosecutors was white or one of the defendants was white, the other one was black. Uh, we also looked at soci socioeconomic bias. One was a fast food worker, um, the other was an accountant. And we, you know, looked at all of these decisions that prosecutors all across the country uh, made to, to see how they were charging. How do we uh, look at what, you know, what are we noticing? And lots of things uh, came out with the study. So one of the surprising findings was that we actually didn't find racial bias um, as far as, you know, on a piece of paper. So, you know, they looked at the race of the defendant, uh, didn't seem to impact their charging. Socioeconomic status also didn't seem to matter. Uh, interesting in that point, um, as far as, you know, California, you know, thinking about the fines that are provided to defendants, uh, a lot of the people actually noted, oh, this person doesn't seem to have a lot of money, they're a fast food worker, but yet provided uh, monetary penalties of two to $500, some people up to $5,000 for what was what we determined to be a minimal crime. So the, the incident, just to give you a background of of it was a individual who had gone through a bad breakup and he was in the subway uh, looking for money to ride the train, obviously intoxicated, uh, no criminal history, about 25 years old. And he had a knife while he asked for money, which technically can be a felony. He wasn't brandishing the knife, but because he had a knife, it could be a felony or it could be a misdemeanor. And so we wanted to see in this kind of case, which you know, dealt with a potentially violent crime, right? So we knew prosecutors would take it seriously, but also one where no harm was uh, occurred. It was a first time incident, no, no previous criminal history. We wanted to see, are they going to be uh, lenient? Are they not going to be? And what, what the findings, the major finding that I'm here to talk about today is that they ended up, prosecutors nationally ended up charging uh, the defendant 97 percent of the time so only three percent of prosecutors chose not to charge this defendant um, which was shocking to us given that there wasn't any harm there was um, no you know a real uh, kind of harm reported in any of the victim statements or police statements uh, the other thing that was surprising was prosecutors not only charged one crime but ended up charging on average two to three to four um, different crimes so most of them charged misdemeanors, about 16% charged felonies, but but the rest of them charged two to three to four misdemeanors for this crime, which was a little surprising, again, given the nature of what we saw as to be a, kind of a minor incident. Um, and just kind of demographics of the prosecutors, there were offices of about, uh, you know, zero to 100,000 uh, people in their jurisdiction, uh, you know, hundred to five hundred thousand was the the bulk of our prosecutors. So we're we're talking, you know, if you think about California, it'd be you know smaller to mid sized offices. A lot of the larger offices didn't respond. We actually had some responses from heads of prosecutors saying, you know, I'm not allowing my prosecutors to fill this out, kind of thing. Lots of mistrust in the prosecutor community of researchers, which, uh, you know, is whatever you can decide why that might be. But uh, anyway, so that's the um, base of the project. I I, I can reserve time or if you, I don't know if I'm out of time, but I have thoughts on, you know, you know, the, so what, but I imagine that you want me to wait for that. You have one minute. No, go. Oh, I do. Okay. Okay. Keep going. Yeah, and then we can okay. go. Okay. Great. So, uh, you know, my, so what on this, you know, what do we do about these incidents are I'll, I'll name a few things. Um, one thing that I've noticed in my research, and this is not in this particular project, but in other research on prosecutors is most of the guidance given to prosecutors basically tells them to charge the highest crime that they're supposed to charge, that they can charge. And so prosecutors are just kind of, you know, plug and play on that, right? If, if there's a crime they can charge that is highest, they'll do it. And so that's one thing that can change as far as, you know, California can choose to, to uh, 
guide prosecutors and say, you don't always have to charge the highest crime. You can charge what you think is fair, or you don't have to charge at all and still achieve justice and other means through rehabilitation, through restorative justice, other types of methods. Um, another thing that I've noticed is, is happening all over in the country is that oftentimes prosecutors are judged and given even merit pay based on how much they charge. Uh, so, you know, a win is a higher sentence. A win is more convictions. Uh -huh. A win is a trial. Am I out of time? Is that what you're telling no, me? No, I just, I, you have another one. Go ahead. I get it. So the merit pay based on convictions, I get, okay. it. You get the okay, yeah. There's uh, two more, two more points. So one is, um, another thing that is a possibility in California that's not often done. So most states seem to tend towards plea, uh, bargaining plea negotiations as a way to dispose of cases. But one way that uh, some of our prosecutors actually named, named in the comments and seems to be more uh, of a, it seems like a better way is a deferred education or deferred entry of judgment as what you call it in California. And it's basically where the person doesn't get a charge on their record like they do with plea bargaining, right? And the charger only brought if the person uh, doesn't fulfill certain things like probation requirements or other types of things. So that's one thing I think could be uh, really helpful as Ed to encourage prosecutors to do. Okay, I'll stop there. All right, we'll, we'll circle back. We'll have plenty of time. Good, Okay. Great. thank you very much. Um, Mr. Chellis Wood, is, am I pronouncing your name correctly? All right, great. Five minutes starts now. Great, okay. Um, I'm gonna uh, share some slides because uh, I am showing some stats. Okay, can you all see this? Yep. Great. Okay, so um, first of all, thanks for having me. I'm I'm honored to be here today. Uh, my name is Alex Chilswood. I'm the executive director of the Computational Policy Lab. Um, we actually, as of today, are at Harvard Kennedy School, um, but I'm still physically based in California. I know, boo. Um, <laughs> I'm still working from California um, and doing a ton of um, criminal justice work here, including um, uh, helping the state roll out the race-blind charging work that uh, Professor Baradan uh, Boffman uh, started, I think, many years ago. Um, that's now uh, state law here. Um, so I'm happy to be talking about a different study today um, where we focused on something called pre-arraignment incarceration. So for some context, um, in California, I'm sure many of you are familiar with this, but um, in, in our state, um, people who are recently arrested um, and booked into jail um, can be held for up to two business, business days while prosecutors decide whether or not to file charges on their case. So this is pre-arraignment very early in the process. Um, and uh, this period, um, you know, you can imagine since this is technically two business days, if it happens before a weekend or, or a, you know, a weekend that's attached to a holiday, um, this period can extend quite longer than just two days. So for example, somebody booked on Friday evening before Labor Day weekend um, can be held in, in custody until Wednesday um, afternoon. Um, while prosecutors decide um, whether or not to, fi to file their case. We're familiar. Yes, okay. Um, so um, this time in jail, you know, there um, might be some benefits to this um, uh, approach. For example, having some sort of informal cool down period for, um, for arrestees, um, but it also might impose pretty high cost on those who are incarcerated. And on this study, we really focus on uh, folks who um, have their cases eventually dismissed. So this is really their main contact with the um, criminal legal system um, uh, on this specific case. So um, what we did for our study, my colleagues and I, including uh, uh, Jerry Lynn and Shard Goyle, um, we looked at about 30,000 felony cases from a, a major California prosecutor's office um, that came in the door between 2012 and 2017. Um, over this period, um, about half of those booked into custody were never charged for a crime. So this is um, similar to the stats that um, uh, Tom was just showing a few minutes ago. And um, in particular, if we focus on those whose cases were dismissed, um, a lot of those folks still spent a decent amount of time in jail. So about a third of those whose cases were dismissed uh, spent at least three days in jail. And um, you know, I think um, I at least have some sense that this you know could be pretty disruptive for some folks. Um, if you have a job that um, you, you had, uh, you know, employment scheduled those days, or you have, uh, uh, you're responsible for child custody, um, you know, even these very short stints in jail might have pretty severe impacts on people's outcomes, um, and on not only that for that individual, but for their sort of dependents and for their community at large. So um, what we did is we analyzed what would happen if prosecutors took a sort of alternate approach to the status quo. 
um, where instead of waiting for two business days to review a case, they conducted um, these hypothetical early reviews the day after somebody was booked into custody. So this is what this sort of procedure would look like. Um, prosecutors would, in, at least in the uh, jurisdiction that we looked at, they would review about five to 10 cases a day, focusing on cases most likely to be dismissed. Um, this five to 10 number um, was uh, derived from discussions we had the, with the prosecutor where they said this was basically their extra capacity to conduct additional reviews each day. So this seems somewhat reasonable. Um, and in particular, um, this would happen every day, including on weekends. Um, so this is a sort of big, big piece of this is that we really want to be sure, um, you know, reviewing these cases every day, um, the day after somebody's booked. And um, if prosecutors decided to dismiss the case um, at this early review, the arrestee would be released that day. So this is the approach. Um, and we estimated that this um, approach would have sort of several um, benefits. So one, we, we, we estimate that prosecutors could reduce pre-arraignment incarceration for dismissed cases by about 35 to 50%. Um, this is dependent on how many cases they are able to review each day. So that 35% reduction is if they reviewed on average five cases a day, that 50% is if they had the capacity to review uh, 10 extra cases a day at this early review stage. Um, something that might be occurring to you all um, is how this might impact public safety, but we do some um, um, uh, observational causal analysis that says that we don't expect any change in recidivism over a one year period following their booking um, if prosecutors were to follow this early review and release policy. Um, and also, I think something that comes up a lot is that prosecutors, um, when we talk when we talk to prosecutors about this this kind of approach, um, there's often a sense of um, uh, concern that they wouldn't have all the all the necessary information to make an informed decision uh, just the day after somebody's booked because there's still mo some materials that might come in the door down the line. And what we found is just statistically, at least in this jurisdiction that we worked with, um, we could make uh, predictions as to the final charging decision with pretty high accuracy, uh, which suggests that that preliminary information is reasonably informative to being able to make a, a good charging decision, um, even without uh, having all the documents available. All right, that's pretty much it for me. Awesome. Thank you, thank, thank you so much. That was interesting. Um, Ms. Doliak? Oh, can we ask questions now? Or you want us to wait, Mike? I'd rather, I'd rather, unless you have some sort of clarifying question, but I don't want to sort of open the door. I don't know. Okay. So, all right, we'll wait. Opening the door is is dangerous. Yes. Okay. <laughs> try, to, try to keep order. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Well, good morning. Thank you all so much for having me today. Uh, my name is Jennifer Doliak, and I'm currently the Executive Vice President of Criminal Justice at Arnold Ventures. Uh, but I'm an academic economist by training, and until this spring, was an economics professor studying criminal justice policy. Um, in my new role, I continue to pay very close attention to the social science literature on what works to improve public safety and to make our criminal justice system more fair and effective. So I was asked to join you all today to talk about my own, some of my own research and some related work on how prosecutors' decisions affect criminal behavior. So uh, I'm sure, as you all know, for a very long time, it's been standard practice in the U.S. to err toward prosecution and punishment, even for minor offenses. Uh, our goal in doing that has been to deter crime. So if people know they're going to be punished for breaking the law, they'll be less likely to do so. I'm an economist, so I generally believe in the power of incentives like this. But there's also been some concern that throwing the book at low-level offenders could be counterproductive. Their criminal behavior may be the result of poverty or mental illness, behavior that won't respond to our usual incentives. And saddling someone with a criminal record could make it more difficult to find a job or housing in the future, which could unintentionally push them to break even more laws. So who's right? When prosecutors are on the fence about what to do in a particular case, should they err toward punishment or err toward leniency? Now, to some extent, the decision to punish is based on moral and political choices about the role of retribution. We punish people partly because we think they deserve it. Uh, and as a social scientist, I have very little to say about how much we should be doing this. But we also punish people partly because we think it will reduce future crime and make our community safer. And this is something that social scientists like myself can test and measure. So if public safety is our goal, at least in part, what do we know about how prosecuting and punishing more people affects criminal behavior? So in my written testimony, I described in much more detail than I'll, I'll go into now, two recent studies, both made possible by improvements in data availability from prosecutors' offices, in some ways the final frontier in the criminal justice data ecosystem. Uh, and both studies use clever natural experiments to divide defendants into treatment and control groups akin to a lab experiment. 
One considers nonviolent misdemeanor defendants and prosecutors' decisions about whether to dismiss the case at an, at an initial hearing. The other, other study considers nonviolent felony defendants and prosecutors' decisions about whether to convict and punish them as usual or give them a deferred adjudication, which came up earlier. That deferred adjudication means that if the defendant gets through a probationary period with no new misconduct, all their charges will be dropped. So both studies are really measuring the effect of erring toward leniency, not a blanket prosecute, don't prosecute uh, um, policy, but erring toward leniency, giving people, giving more people a second chance to avoid a criminal record. And both studies find really big and somewhat surprising results. At least they were surprising to me. Uh, defendants that got lucky and either had their case dismissed in the misdemeanor cases or got a deferred adjudication in the felony cases were about 50% less likely to come back to that court with a new charge in the future, 50, 50%. So recidivism fell by half. That's huge, especially in a context where it is, quite frankly, really difficult to find policies and programs that reduce reoffending at all. Uh, the effects were biggest for first-time defendants, which implies that avoiding a first misdemeanor conviction or a first felony conviction is what's driving these big benefits. So the way I've come to think about it, these defendants are essentially standing at, the, at a fork in the road. We can pull them into the criminal justice system or send them on their way and hope they don't come back. And it turns out that sending them on their way with this second chance to avoid that first conviction enables many of them to change course, and many of them will. So what should we do with all of this? Uh, prosecutors have lots of discretion, obviously, in how they handle cases, and there are good reasons not to completely eliminate that discretion, even if we could. <laughs> um, but state policymakers can help push prosecutors in the direction of more leniency by making leniency easier and punishment harder. So for instance, we could remove any bureaucratic hurdles that exist to providing deferred adjudications. Maybe we could add a little more, a little extra paperwork uh, for, for convictions as usual. Um, that would all help align incentives and push prosecutors in a direction in the direction we, we want them to go for the uh, for the benefit of public safety, to make sure they're focusing their conviction time and energy where it's most warranted and most beneficial. This is an area I will highlight where academics and policymakers should be actively collaborating and experimenting to find practices that improve public safety. There's a lot we don't know about where to draw the line here. Um, and I will also uh, plug that organizations like Arnold Ventures are eager to support the evaluation of such efforts. So that's what I've got for you today. And I'm really looking forward to the conversation. Super, very helpful, thank you. Um, Senator Skinner, let's begin with you. I know you had a question. My question was for Alex, whether that you had any data, I know there's not that many places that have eliminated um, bail, but uh, whether in those um, where you described someone being held for a couple of days or over that weekend, uh, is the presence of bail or not any factor in that? Um, I don't have that data, unfortunately. Um, this was also the, the sort of period that we looked at, I think, was, um, you know, before a lot of these more recent reforms, so. Yeah, that was that was my question, uh, Chair. My sense is, at least in the jurisdiction that we worked with, if it's helpful, um, when bail was in place, you know, I think a lot of these folks technically could have bailed themselves out, but I, th I think were unable to for whatever reason. And so um, they still might have spent, you know, five days in, in custody. Yeah. And I, I, I'm going to follow up on that. Go ahead, Carlos. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. On that question of, of bail, I mean, that's something that we've reviewed before under that, uh, you know, pre arraignment incar incarceration. So, uh, you know, we have some ideas about that. It may be kind of expensive, but I think we're on the right track. Uh, then the second thing I have was just the observation on. Something uh, Shima said that uh, struck me as quite, uh, I don't know, as presenting a severe conflict, and that's the old issue of merit pay or how yeah. a prosecutor, you know, being uh, rewarded for the number of times they go to trial or secure a conviction. You know, I can't remember the exact phrasing, but, you know, the obligation of a prosecutor is, is not to obtain a conviction, but to do justice. And it seems that merit pay would be a conflict. Uh, so I just wonder if, 
you know, what, what data you have as to how they measure uh, whether someone, whether merit pay is, is uh, awarded and has that ever been challenged? Is that something a matter of public public knowledge? I know that you know prosecutors who who do go to trial and get convictions, you know, are often uh, gain status within the office and perhaps are promoted. But the idea of merit pay uh, just seems to be inherently uh, unconstitutional. Yeah, I think most prosecutors' offices. You know, the only reason I found out that this is still ongoing is that prosecutors have let on to me where they want to be more progressive. And they've said, you know, I've stopped giving rewards for merit pay, but none of this is official policy. It's never written down. It's unofficial. And so, you know, maybe it's difficult to even legislate, but it definitely is happening. And like you said, you know, the prosecutors that win the convictions often even longer sentences, which is surprising to me as well, um, often are, are rewarded. And so, you know, there has to be some way with public policy and you're the experts on that, but to incentivize offices to not uh, use these systems because again, it can't be challenged in court because it's not written down. Right. And, and I know folks like myself and uh, Judge Espinosa are really skeptical whenever a prosec prosecutor says, you know, I've won the last 10 of my trials. I mean, they've cherry picked those cases and they get, they get the, the record, uh, but you know, again, I think that kind of uh, bragging is is really unseemly. Tom or any other staff, do we have any sense about that this practice is active in California? Nothing concrete, but um, it's probably varied a lot by you know <laughs> each, each office. But I can't imagine we've totally eradicated it. All right, Senator Skinner. That was the question I was going to ask, whether we have California-specific, uh, you know, that survey included California prosecutorial offices. I mean, yes, I think it did. Oh, sorry. It, it, included, it included California offices. Yes. No, I think that, you know, you could imagine a piece of legislation that prohibited the practices altogether, whether or not it was explicit or not. And that would seem to be a good thing. I guess my question is, it's similar to the Prop 8 data that we talked about earlier. Would it actually change anything at the end of the day? Which is really what we want to get to. Um, so I don't know. That's something that I would I would think about. Um, I have another question. Go ahead. This is for um, Jennifer. Uh, Jennifer, the um, uh, your data on these were people that were arrested, but then not either dismissals or what was your other? It was either a dismissal or a. A, a formal arraignment. So we're looking at them at the initial arraignment hearing and it can either go forward and they were officially arraigned or the case was dismissed. Okay. And it was the ones whose case were dismissed that you had the very um, low uh, recidivism and low uh, percent that came back before the court. That's right. Yep. Um, and with those, do you know if any of them were because they had a they were directed to a diversion program? Were you able to to you know uh, parse the data out like that? I had the same question. Yeah, so we didn't have um, we didn't have great data on diversion. So so anecdotally, some of the cases might have gone to some sort of diversion program, but um, but my understanding is that the vast majority were not in this in this case. And from talking to the, the folks in the DA's office, these were primarily dismissals. So um, I don't know if there's any basis of fact in this or whether there has been a lot of data, but um, you know, I hear anecdotally from uh, some that it's the fear of getting caught is a greater deterrent than the actual, um, than the conviction or the sentence. Mm -hmm. So this seems to lend to that, that, you know, once you, but, but of course, to convince people of that, we'd need probably better or more extensive data. So, so yeah, I completely agree that that, that is something that comes out of, um, out of the research very clearly at this point. Um, you know, again, I, I'm an economist, I believe in incentives, uh, and um, it turns out that people pay much more attention to the probability of getting caught as an incentive than the long-term effects of their actions, which are going to be, you know, two years in prison instead of one year. You have to be looking that far ahead to be 
for that to be entering into your mind. Um, the evidence on on the probability of getting caught often comes from things like DNA databases and surveillance cameras and all of those kinds of things, and they're super effective at reducing recidivism. Uh, and so, so the evidence on that is is quite clear. And I I agree with you that um, that this this other evidence that I was talking about today is definitely in line with that that what I had previously been thinking of as a separate line of work. Um, and, and I think also highlight something that came up in the conversation about, a lot about this research when it first came out, that erring toward leniency and dropping the case at the arraignment hearing doesn't mean there aren't any consequences, right? Mm -hmm. So this person was arrested, they had to come to court, they're stressed out about it, you know, they're kind of like grappling with the possibility that there could be real consequences here, or there could be punishment. Um, and then their case is dismissed and they're given the second chance. So this doesn't mean we should just like stop, we should decriminalize all of these offenses and not, you know, not arrest people. Maybe for some of them that too, but that would be a different study, right? That's not what we're showing here. Um, so I think there is something about just making sure that they're, that the consequences don't have to be big to be a wake up call, especially for first time offenders. So I have a couple of questions. Uh, Jennifer, just to follow up on that. So would your recommendation be for first-time offenders, is this low-level, I mean, nonviolent misdemeanors or nonviolent misdemeanors and felonies on the first-time offender effects that you're seeing? Do you, do you differentiate? Both. Both. So so they're separate studies. So our, right. my paper with, with Amanda and Anna was looking at first-time nonviolent misdemeanors. The second paper by Mike Mueller-Smith and Kevin Schnapel was on uh, felony nonviolent felonies, but they were also very similar uh, results in the sense that they were also um, the biggest benefits for first time defendants. And would your recommendation be automatic dismissal for those cases? I don't, I don't think that's what either study shows. Um, I think basically both of them are saying we should be there would be greater public safety if more pro if prosecutors acted like the mo the more lenient prosecutors in both cases. So again, erring toward leniency, moving in the direction of the more lenient prosecutors, there are always going to be defendants in either of these these settings that every prosecutor is going to agree that person should definitely be prosecuted and and we should punish them. Um, and we can't say anything in our study about whether or not prosecuting them would um, would do any good. Uh, I suspect that, um, you know, the, the risk here is you don't want to get into a situation where like everyone's guaranteed one free shoplifting charge, right? right? <laughs> so so you, you want the prosecutors to have some discretion, but already we are in a situation where a lot of prosecutors lose, use their leniency or their ability to be lenient more often than others. And what these papers show is that they are... Um, those prosecutors are are uh, their actions are benefiting public safety more than the, the more harsh prosecutors. Got it. And I'm going to come back to you in a second. Um, Alex, it seems to me that you were also suggesting incentivizing this the early um, decisions on dismissal. Would you would you go so far as to require it, or do you think it's the same sort of um, discretionary? practice that Jennifer was suggesting in her remarks. Yeah. So in, in our um, sort of proposed approach, you know, there's, there's no comment on discretion here. So all we're saying is just move up when the actual review happens. Um, you'd still preserve full discretion. Um, you're just making the decision a little bit earlier and possibly with, with fewer um, documents to review. Um, those, so just to, just yeah. to make sure I get it clean. So your recommendation, just your magic wand, you're the king of the day for, it would say, move everything up to within the first 24 hours. And that would be your, a requirement. And then you could exercise the same amount of discretion as opposed to incentivizing people to make the decision earlier. You would just require it. Yeah. I mean, you could also, um, you know, I think there's many different intermediate approaches that you could do. So you could say, we're only going to do this process for certain cases, um, especially those that are more likely to be dismissed. Um, so that was one thing I didn't talk about a lot, but we have this statistical model that prioritizes cases that are most likely to be dismissed for this early review. And um, it's fairly straightforward. It's basically just a heuristic checklist that somebody could do with a, a pen and paper. Right. Um, but essentially what you could do is you could sort of isolate the you know, um, incoming referral charges that are most likely to be dismissed, the highest dismissal rates, and just, and just focus on 
early review for those cases and possibly preserve you know, this, this um, later review for more serious cases or cases that are much more likely to be charged. Um, so I think there's many different sort of intermediate versions here where you don't sort of say this should happen for every single incoming case. But you know, any sort of intervention here, I think, especially conducting these reviews the day after somebody's booked um, and focusing on, on cases that are most likely to, to be dismissed, I think would have big impacts on this pre-arraignment incarceration. Got it. All right. So um, moving back to the kind of the incentive approach that Jennifer, you were suggesting, um, this is something in different ways we've gravitated towards these types of reforms. Our favorite words are presumption, you know, trying to build in presumptions, which are different kinds of ways to weight the system. Um, and later on today, we'll be talking about programs that have worked or that have been tried, at least in California, to put financial incentives on various stakeholders in order to um, incentivize outcomes that we would presume are better for public policy. I was wondering if you have experience with that, you think that that's a good way to go, for example, um, offering more money to agencies that um, offer dismissals um, or punishing them for not. I mean, I was wondering if you've seen that. I mean, basically a lever that we have or the state has is, you know, financial incentives to, to do this. It doesn't create requirements one way or another, and but helpfully nudge things in the right direction. Do you think that that's a way to go? Uh, I haven't. So I haven't seen um, I haven't seen other states or counties experiment with that, but I think it would be a really great thing to try. Uh, definitely feels like the kind of policy that would shift things in the right direction while still allowing uh, you know, criminal justice actors on the ground in any given case to do what needs to be done and uh, or with what they, you know, in, in the cases that they view as more serious, where there's a real public safety interest in, in you know, prosecuting and punishing somebody, they're not barred from doing that in any way. They're simply pushed in the direction of, uh, right. of more leniency and, and recognizing the the costs um, of of not being lenient. Um, and I mean, I will say, so, so in the, the Suffolk County paper that, that my colleagues and I wrote, we had a separate part of that paper was looking at what happened when the district attorney in that County, um, this was the, was with the nonviolent misdemeanors instituted a presumption of non-prosecution. So again, kind of flipping the defaults from a presumption of prosecution to a presumption of non-prosecution for right. non, for, or for a list of nonviolent misdemeanors. And uh, and it was extremely effective. Like basically, we saw the same results we'd seen before. We were just comparing different types of prosecutors, um, and we didn't see any increase in crime, which is the main thing people worry about. That there would just be a reduction, in general deterrence, and everyone now knows there's more leniency, and so they can go out and and shoplift or trespass to their heart's content. Um, and so so there is so even that kind of change in labeling um, and and change stated change in preference seemed to be uh effective in within an office um and uh so yeah this does seem like an area where just finding finding either financial ways or other kinds of incentives that can push folks in in, in the direction you want them to go would work all right so how I, i'm curious if you have any other ideas on how you how you incentivize or push nudge people in the right direction without requiring it you could imagine a state pol a state law that instituted the presumption mm -hmm. right now, you could also imagine, I, I don't know, trainings in different offices, other interventions, besides the financial incentives, which we'll talk about later today, yep. or how do you get DA's offices to institute those policies? Are there any other ways that you could imagine incentivizing the outcome that you seem to be encouraging? Yeah, so the paperwork example I gave before is one, right? Just make it harder, make it more time consuming to do the thing you don't want them to do. And um, does that work? Has that worked any, I mean, is I don't, I, again, I don't know of any place that has actually tried that, but mm -hmm. again, feels no, like- No, I understand. You can make them count to 10 before they have to do yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> um, there are a couple other ideas that are out there. So one one that comes up, especially in research circles every once in a while, and there might be actually some, some researchers trying this in different offices, is just providing data to the prosecutors about, because I think a lot of prosecutors and judges don't know what happens to the defendants in their cases after they leave, right? So you could imagine providing data on what the recidivism rates were for people that came through 
their their dockets, um, cases they handled, um, and perhaps even comparing them with other prosecutors in their in, in their offices. So you know your your dismissal rate was this, and your recidivism rate was up here, and over here this person's dis dismissal rate was was higher or lower, and they had this kind of recidivism rate. Um, just to give people a better sense of where they fall in the office, and it might do might do something to push. Um, the harsher prosecutors in a more lenient direction, if they kind of know they're they're outside the norm, it might also push the more lenient prosecutors to be more harsh. So this is something that kind of needs to be um, experimented with. I think needs to be evaluated. The other um, the other potential levers that I'll mention really come from the that Mike Mueller Smith Kevin Schnabel paper, which would which led to the natural experiments that allowed them to measure the effects of divert adjudications. So these these events happened that then dramatically changed prosecutors' use of this policy. One was um, uh, was some sort of bureaucratic change that did, in fact, just make deferred adjudications much less, less appealing. So if they, they did a, a deferred adjudication and then the person uh, committed some sort of crime on while they're on probation, they would have to like go back and and try them again or something. It was extra, extra work for them to then get them the, the punishment that they would have gotten up front. And so prosecutors were like, forget this. We're just going straight to, uh, to punishment. Right. So it's a kind of in line with my paperwork idea, right. It's just like making it harder, um, or making it less, making it easier or harder to do the, um, the thing right. you, uh, you want or don't want them to do. And the other change was, um, perhaps, less appealing in this particular context, but the other big natural experiment was a, a change in prison capacity. So suddenly uh, there's gonna be a huge increase in prison overcrowding um, because a, bail, uh, a prison bond uh, failed at, at, to just barely. And so suddenly all the courts were like, wait, we need to scale back who we're, who we're convicting because we don't have anywhere to put them. Um, so again, they're kind of different way, all of these kind of suggest different ways of putting pressure on prosecutors to lean this way instead of that way. But as, in, as far as you know, there's no one that you feel like is particularly effective that's actually been implemented and worked. No, you guys okay. would, you would, uh, I am I am excited to see you all try something along these lines. I think it could be a great example for other places. All right, because we are thinking about incentive programs before we move on, uh, Shima or Alex, do you have any experience with these to try to nudge policies in the right directions with incentives? sort of statewide incentives, whether they're financial or otherwise, in order to sort of, the idea is to kind of maintain discretion, right? You want to maintain some level of discretion, especially for edge cases. Um, but on the other hand, encourage public policies that we think are being more effective and more equitable. So oh, I don't know of any programs as well, like Jennifer, there's, there really probably aren't any, or we probably know about them. But um, one thing I would add as well to what her points, which I totally agree with, is, um, Prosecutors don't have any any incentive right now to collect any data. And so within a, even the same office, we saw prosecutors charging mass, you know, wide disparity as far as like one would say one day, one would say one year of incarceration in, in the same office. And so I think it's because prosecutors don't know what they're doing. And so if there's some incentive to collect data on what they're doing, how often they're charging, how often they're dismissing cases, just because that's that becomes the default. And Often, one thing that I wanted to make a point of, you know, a lot of prosecutors we think are declining cases. So there's prosecutor declination, but it actually, for my experiment, I'm my guess would be it's actually not happening very often. It's not like prosecutors at the outset of a crime are saying, oh, I'm not going to charge this. It's often dismissed because they can't find a witness. They can't get whatever they need to charge the case. And so I do think, you know, the more data that shows this, that might have external um eyes on these offices. I think that's really the key here. So just the prosecutors themselves looking at their data, I don't think that's really going to matter. But, you know, the incentive has to be from outside observance of what they're doing. No, I, I think that that's quite right. And something that we as a committee have been working on and collecting that data with our partners at uh, California Policy Lab, I should say, with help also from Arnold Ventures, is to um, make a lot of this data a lot more transparent to see kind of sort of the market, I would all say the marketplace of punishments for various crimes in, in your particular jurisdiction or others, I think will have help for transparency, at least, uh, I suspect, you know, um, bring some more consistency, or at least we hope. Um, Alex, have you had any encounters with these incentive programs? Um, you know, I, it just strikes me there's a parallel with the race blind charging um, bill and sort of proposed process that's going into place as well, where um, 
there if prosecutors reverse their decision from the race blind uh, initial race blind review on their final review uh, you know getting in the weeds here on, on race blind charging but um what the bill requires is that it's just we just ask prosecutors to explain why they reverse their decision and so i think in this sort of setup you could imagine four first-time offenders just requiring prosecutors to explain why they you know want to charge this person um and just like basically asking them to be conscious and sort of explicit about their reason, which still preserves their discretion and, and it's entirely, but you're just encouraging them to be really, you know, um, uh, um, yeah, conscious awesome. about that that decision, exactly, rather than just having it be a sort of normal practice. And this so there it's Jennifer's idea of increasing the bureaucratic paperwork, yeah. Exactly. I think even sort of, you know, certainly you can make it very difficult, but even sort of minimal things, I think, might might have some some effect. Um, and, and I don't have any, um, I don't know of any sort of studies on this either, but I think that's, you know, intuitively, you could imagine that that helping. And I do want to get other, back... One other quick thought on that. Yeah. So, I mean, Go it ahead. reminds me also of sentencing guidelines, right? I mean... There are voluntary sentencing guidelines that similarly, you have to justify going outside the guidelines. Those have been in effect lots of places for a lot of years and generally people stay within the guidelines. No, I think that that's quite right. And that's, you know, the, our favorite word presumption, you know, sneaks back into it. Um, but you, Alex, you did mention um, the race blind uh, charging and it's something that Shima, you also had mentioned in your opening remarks. And I believe, I don't know if you guys are also referring to a study or some work that was done in San Francisco, where they, I believe, were able to block out the race of the defendants. Um, and that they, I, correct me if I'm wrong, is that the, the result was actually no, no real change in charging decisions, which was sort of good news, that even after they blocked out the race of the defendant, that it really didn't seem to affect the charge. Is that, is, first of all, am I remembering the study correctly? And that, and that should be the good news, that, that, that there is a high number of discretionary um, action going on by the district attorneys, but it, at least in the studies that have been done, does not seem to be uh, as racially biased as one might have been concerned about. Is that correct? Yeah. So that was um, a project that came out of our lab um, as well. Um, and, you know, just a couple of thoughts there. One, I think um, to Tom's earlier point, I think there's a lot of heterogeneity and, and or, you know, variation across counties in California. And I think San Francisco is a very special example um, compared to other counties. So I, I don't know that um, I, I, I'm pretty hesitant to say that that's what I would expect to find everywhere. Um, there has been some research done, you know, over the past few decades, just um, observationally that suggests that it that it does occur elsewhere. Um, so I think that's an open question. Um, certainly was encouraged to see that in San Francisco. The other thing I'll note about that study is it was pretty small. Um, just it got the the intervention got cut short by the by the pandemic. Um, and so it's possible that that it did affect behavior and we just didn't have the sort of um, we, we didn't have we didn't see enough cases to really be able to say anything with confidence. So um, that's something we're hoping to study um, uh, for the statewide rollout as well. Um, you know, the other thing I'll mention used in San Francisco, is the same software being used in San Francisco? Is it ongoing? Um, San Francisco stopped. Um, Yolo County outside of Sacramento um, is started using it in 2021 and has continued using it. And we're building a sort of a version two of of the algorithm that's going to help um, basically most prosecutors across the state do this do this process. Um, uh, the other thing I'll mention, you know, I, I think something that's came out come, came out of the intervention in, in YOLO for race blind charging is that there's a pretty big procedural justice benefit here that's that's separate from the impacts on, um, you know, charging decisions and, and bias in charging. And so that might also be something that you consider um, for, for this question about charging decisions in general um, is folks in, in, in YOLO County in particular reacted very positively to just the prosecutors taking this intervention and talking about um, you know, the fact that they cared about bias and, and charging decisions and wanted to do something about it. And we're, we're taking concrete steps to address that. And so I think um, I certainly as somebody who's, you know, data oriented, I'm, I'm very curious and sort of understanding impacts on specific decisions. But I think there's always, you know, these sort of secondary impacts on on perceptions of criminal justice that are super important, um, maybe harder to measure, but um, also, you know, super useful. Uh, the Yolo County DA's office, they've spoken a few times this panel there, I think pushing some very interesting uh, interventions. Shima, you had mentioned also some maybe counterintuitive race-based findings. Is that is it consistent with what Alex was saying? 
Yeah. So Alex actually uh, kind of effectuated an idea that I published with a couple other people on the, on the bail front. Um, but this other thing I was telling you about the prosecutor piece of it. So our incident reports gave race. And again, we found no racial bias um, when the person was black versus white. So uh, very consistent with what Alex is saying. Hmm. All right. Well, I guess that's good news. It, Senator Skinner. Yes, it is. But I think it depends on that. Well, First off, we already know that the from the data we have collected that who comes before the prosecutor, in other words, who is the police even stop and who even gets arrested, already there's that racial bias. Mm -hmm. And then depending on the jurisdiction, if the majority of, of the people that are brought before the prosecutor, uh, you can eliminate the race off the sheet, but if the majority of people that come before them are um, non-white, then they, so I, I think this, I think where the racial issues come in is really much more in the, before it even gets the prosecutor. Um, that leads me to another um, question that I've had is looking through this data, a couple of questions actually, and this is to all three panelists. First of all, we're obviously focused on California and a lot of the data that we collect on California and data that, that Tom presented were California. Is that unusual? For example, the high, or I, well, we'll say the, the dismissal rate in California, um, depending on how you count it, is, is not insignificant. Is that consistent with other states that you're seeing? Or is California not like, are we already doing a good job or a decent job? Or we are already well on our way on dismissing uh, a good number of cases relative to peer states, let's say. I guess I'll start if no one else wants yeah. to, but um, so it, the thing is, there's a lot of dismissals, particularly with misdemeanors, I think the data shows sometimes up to 90% of misdemeanors are dismissed. The, it's interesting that California has such high dismissal rate for, for felonies. That's something I haven't seen. So I don't, it could be unusual, but I, again, there's not a ton of data on this. Um, I think, uh, as mentioned before, I think by Jennifer, uh, but by the time you get to a dismissal though, so much harm has already been done. I mean, the person has a charge on their record. So ideally we get rid of this before, you know, with deferred prosecution, you know, adjudication in the, in the first place. And I know you kind of mentioned that as well. I know you're familiar with that. Oh, no. I, yes. No, I was I was going to even go earlier in the process and say maybe the maybe we should be focusing on the police if, you know, sure. a third to half or 90, whatever percentage you're talking about are actually being dismissed. Perhaps um, that's where the intervention should be. I realize that that eliminates some of the consequences that Jennifer was talking about, right? If we didn't have any consequences and put, but in any event, I'm just trying to lo locate yeah. California nationally in the data. Alex or Jennifer, do you have any sus suspicion of where Cal California's dismissal rates work nationally? I, I think this is really challenging mostly because we don't have great data from prosecutors offices in general. Um, that's getting better and you all are obviously trying to make it better in your state, um, but California is a really big and diverse state. So I suspect it's uh you know, the more conservative counties are probably not that different from a lot of other places in the country. Um, Alex? You know, similar answer. I just have seen a ton of variation for, with the prosecutors that we work with. So I, I hesitate to say that other states are sort of, you know, generally dismissing fewer and more cases. Should we say, should we say, hey, California is actually doing a pretty good job um, in weeding out either meritless cases or cases that would do better on dismissal? Or, I mean, should we, should we take this data as good news? The, the rel I'm going to say relatively high dismissal rate. That the, whatever um, filtering function is built into the system, that we're doing a decent job. I mean, I think the honest answer is it would be great to do a study in, Calif in, in you know, various settings in California, similar to what was done in Harris County and Suffolk County, um, where you're looking at you know, the cases that are on the margin in that particular county, what happens to them if they go to a lenient versus harsh prosecutor? Um, 
or if there's some sort of like you, if you all try to implement some policy change, what happens to the recidivism of the people who are, who now get a different outcome because of that policy change? I think there's so, there's so many different factors that lead to the filter, right? Depends on who the police are, are arresting in that particular county. And then what the process is to actually wind up being arraigned and, and, you know, the different, the different steps along the way, it might be that the bulk of the cases the, the main way that cases are disposed of is is those dismissals, whereas in one of the other counties, it might be the police just don't make those arrests the, to begin with. And so it's just really hard to say based on the descriptive data, like that's the right number of dismissals. I, it's never going to be a right number. I just wanted to know if you encouraged <laughs> or not. Well, and, and this, this actually relates to another question that I had that maybe goes to Tom, is we saw why county disparities. Um, is there any way to know along what Jennifer was saying that these are similar arrests or are the police and sheriff departments in different counties making wildly different arrests that would explain the, dis the different dismissal rates? Or can we say like, no, they're actually kind of arresting for similar types of crimes and similar kinds of scenarios? Unfortunately, we can't speak to it. We just sort of see what starts as a felony in court, but not what the charges are or what the arrest uh, of offense was. Um, so we can't sort of account for that first uh decision that the is made on how to charge something or what even what is arrested for, which is um, too bad. How much do we think this goes to you, Tom, or perhaps the rest? The California's wobbler system is really doing a lot of work here, right? Where so same crime and it's either chargeable as a felony or a misdemeanor. And the pro the I guess originally it starts with the police, the police officer, the arresting officer that can say, I'm wobbling this up to a felony arrest. Is that the way it works? I, you know, I'm not, I'm not sure what, how often the, the arrest and the sort of charging level diverge, but, but, you know, as we looked at in lots of contexts, California does not have a very structured um, offense scheme. You know, we just have sort of, robbery and then you kind of have higher punishments in some circumstances and you know other states will have like five degrees of different offenses that you can track a little bit more closely so you wouldn't have you know a wobbler burglar you'd have burglary second burglary third or something like that so you know but often the factual distinctions between those offenses are, are very fine too so i don't i don't think it probably is that different in how those cases at what level those cases are, are charged we just sort of have a different road to get to the same destination ultimately different signs on the road maybe long answer saying i don't think so <laughs> michael can i make yes. one point on that uh, the police versus prosecutor point so yeah. i actually did a different study that we're not talking about today but that showed i was looking at mass incarceration and, and who's causing more of a problem there was is it police or prosecutors because you can look at police arrests and then you can look at pr prosecutor charging and what's been so fascinating in the last 20 years is that police have really reduced the number of arrests that they mm -hmm. are um i guess what do you call it uh doing mm -hmm. and pr making yes what's that word um but but prosecutors for the commensurate number of arrests are charging a lot more so it's almost like prosecutors even give them less arrests they're just making they're charging more per incident than they were before because they can and so I I mean not to say like prosecutors are not at fault in lots of ways I think you know as the senator pointed out there's definitely racial bias and other problems we have there but as far as charging and mass incarceration I do think prosecutors are in this mindset where they just charge so much more than they uh, even when they're given less arrests by police and so the numbers are really bad for prosecutors on that front. That, I, I, I'm not surprised, and I and I and I want to just make sure that I appreciate that. That's I suspect that that's at work. But could it also be that police are being more discerning, right? So the arrests that they're making are just better arrests, and that so therefore prosecutors a higher percentage of their cases they're charging because with fewer arrests we've made better ones. Um, well, I mean, I, I think that would mean. They would be charging those cases, but but um, why more counts per case than when we had that many more arrests? I guess that's what I'm trying to understand. Is it doesn't seem to it doesn't seem to square away for me why we have we're arresting the worse or worse people now. Does that not work? Um, I mean, I guess potentially, but um, you know, I've always it, the way I've looked at it is it seems like 
uh, it's, there's just so many more, but um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, that's one way to look at the data. You know, I, I can, I can, you know, the, these reports um, on what happens to felony arrests go back, you know, a couple of decades in California. So I can go take a look and sort of see if there's an equilibrium. Like, is it always that 20% of felony arrests are dismissed or, or rejected? Is there sort of just, or has that number changed when there even were more arrests? So that's something we can look at pretty easily, at least in, in California. Um, Cause there is this sense that, and that was with some of the research around Prop 8 that purported to be a plea bargain ban show that there's just sort of an equilibrium that happens in the system. Like, you know, we have 100 cases come in, 20, 20 are going to be rejected. We have 200 cases come in, 40 are going to be rejected. It's going to sort of be that same proportion, which I know someone who has a PhD in systems thinking can figure that out for us. But um, it does seem to be in the data a little bit. So I can take a look at look at that, Mike. All right, that, that would be awesome. Um, we're... Coming to towards the end of uh, this panel, I want to make sure, first of all, that no committee members have any last questions, and then I have sort of something for everybody. Peter, you just uh, clicked on. You're good. Um, all right. You know, as I said at the beginning, and what we really, this is, first of all, it's a very interesting conversation. Thank you. All your work is really thought-provoking. But we, we're trying, you know, one of the charges, or what I try to hope that we come out of all these meetings are really concrete recommendations that we can take to the governor and legislature. Um, and um, as much as I hate to ask you to boil down your, you know, careers and years of research into sort of discrete ideas, I'm going to do that. We've touched on some of them, but I just want to make sure that these would be the top recommendations, at least along the lines that we've been talking about. Beginning with you, Alex, it seems like your top recommendation based on the find based on the research that we've discussed today would be to say, hey, uh, prosecutors, you need you are required, again, not a dis one of these incentive based to make a charging decision within 24 hours or whatever, as, as early as we can in the process. Is that your, your number one? Yeah, or at least, you know, set up a, a procedure for early review on some cases, um, allowing for this, yeah, early review to happen, you know, maybe not for every case, not for homicide cases, next, for example. For next number, you're right, exactly. For some exactly. subset of cases that you thought might be um, likely to be dismissed, let's move that decision up as, as quickly in the process we did, we've done. Yeah. Uh, coincidentally, and I'll get to you in a second, Justice Marino, um, we have a recommendation and heard previously in the year that early assignment of public defenders actually also increases uh, good outcome. So I think that actually moving everything, and we are very aware of this system in California that we have where it could be 48 hours, but holidays and Thanksgiving, and you know it, it can be quite a long period of time. Mm -hmm. Mr. Moreno? Yeah, just, uh, just two things, uh, uh, Michael. You, you were freezing out on me. <laughs> Oh. Right now. I'm not sure if it was the same for anybody else, uh, but that's beside the point. I did have a question for, for Tom on, on the DA rejects. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, here in Los Angeles, probably in San Diego, where city attorneys file misdemeanor uh, cases, uh, is there, are we double counting at all? I mean, it's like a, a wobbler situation. Are those uh, misdemeanor prosecutions that are DA rejects, are those being picked up in the data that, as far as you know? So the data that we have, which is what the Department of Justice reports, is just about felony arrests. So we actually don't know what happens in, in misdemeanors, but we do see that a lot are dismissed in court. So I, I wonder if that sort of translates into an even higher rejection rate um, yeah. for, for the arrests. And I, I'm pretty sure that a dismissal when the DOJ or a rejection means it's it's rejected entirely. It's not that it's rejected oh. as a felony and comes back as a as a misdemeanor. I think it's totally like see you Wrong. later. I I believe that's the case. Yes. Yeah, so I, I, I don't I, think so. So so if it's picked up as a misdemeanor, not as a wobbler, but as a misdemeanor by a city attorney, that's not being accounted for. I think that would show up as a conviction. Or if, if you're then convicted of it, it would only be a rejection if, if if it was never picked up again. That's my understanding. Yeah. Okay. And and Mike, a little bit on on the point of Alex's study. I think um you know he mentioned a checklist, and I think the that sort of predicts the cases that are most likely to be dismissed. And it's stuff that I think prosecutor it won't shock anyone. I, maybe Alex, if you could just tell us like the two or three of the predictive things just to confirm that. 
Yeah, so this is looking at things like um, the referral charges, the the type of you know alleged crime that was committed, um, somebody's recent local um, number of referrals they've had or number of arrests, um, whether there was the case was um, gang involved or had an elderly victim. All of these things, I think, um, tend to correlate with whether cases were dismissed or or charged. And so you could imagine identifying a subset of cases to say, hey, these should go through early review because they're, you know, pretty high high chance of them being dismissed. Thanks, Tom. I don't want to um, go down the rabbit hole, but it sort of struck me as you were describing that the cases are being dismissed, not because necessarily of bad evidence. There's no reason why elder abuse cases would have harder, be harder to prove than, but just that, um, or easier to prove. But just that we think that these are kind of undeserving In, of incarceration. Interest of justice, exactly. Yeah, there could be many reasons for that. No, of course there are many reasons, but when sometimes I, I got it. All right. Yeah. Uh, um, go ahead, Alex. Just one other quick point. Um, I think pretty important. I just want to highlight the sort of idea of discretion not only happening with each each individual case, but also for the for the office at large. And so I think there's discretion that offices take. You know, for example, to decide which cases are eligible for diversion, for example, that have pretty large impacts um, to Senator Skinner's point on, you know, different communities. And so you could imagine, for example, if you really focus on first time offenders, that might disproportionately exclude, you know, black members of the black community who might have sort of higher higher rates of historical contact with the criminal justice system. And so I think there's like the separate layer of discretion that's happening on the office level about how to approach, you know, prosecution at large that I think is just as important as the sort of individual um, decisions whether or not to charge a given case um, that, you know, could also have pretty big downstream impacts. Interesting. Got it. Uh, Shima, moving on to you, um, it seems to me um, that one of the things that you would maybe suggest for us to take on is the idea of that are perhaps these incentives and particularly financial incentives within district attorney's office is based on number of prosecutions and whatnot. So would you, would if you had to make rec one recommendation out of the suggestions that we've talked about today, is it that the state should prohibit that practice, whether, and I, I know that it's difficult to say whether or not it's going on, but we could prohibit it. Yeah, no, I think um, making it more difficult to uh, charge more counts, making it more difficult or incentivizing to not charge more counts, incentivizing to not create a public record or a, you know, a criminal record when possible. I think one thing I'll note too, that Alex's comment made um, you think of is oftentimes a lot of reforms go to, well, let's make it for nonviolent anything. Um, we have to be careful to do that because I think a lot of, you know, charges are placed in the violent category, but they're not our typical kind of violent crimes that we really are concerned about. Um, it's, it's, you know, having a gun, it's whatever, when no violence was used by that. So I think we do need to be careful with that because I think a lot of good reform is, is avoided because of that. Um, Obviously, you all know that most of our incarcerated, uh, most of our incarcerated people are violent. And so if we don't cut that, we're never going to really make a big impact. I'm not quite sure about that. Um, <laughs> about, about, no, I, I, I do think I do. We're well aware of the sensitivity about making distinctions between violent and nonviolent uh, crimes and people who have been conv convicted in that. But I do think um there's a still a shocking number of people who are incarcerated every year um, for nonviolent uh, conduct. Totally. Something that we're kind of b b bringing back into focus, or at least I am. Um, and uh, Jennifer, just to make sure that um, I have your takeaway, is it fair to say that um, your takeaway would be, um, let's try to find incentives, whether they're financial, uh, whether there's some kind of advisory guidelines, or bureaucratic that we could push folks um, towards, I guess, dismissal, especially for first time offenders. Or deferred adjudications for more serious crimes. I think, yes, I will add one more um, that, uh, you know, if you've got the power to impose or to, to provide financial incentives, I think the answers to a lot of these questions that you're asking, like these are answers we would like to find out. And the only way we're going to find out is if the offices work with researchers and share their data 
and, uh, and, you know, test, you know, test some new things, try some new things and see if they work. And so incentives to local offices to in, increase their data availability and transparency and, and working with researchers would be a huge help to everyone. And you mean local prosecutorial offices? I mean, local, local offices. Yeah. Primarily that's where the data live. You could imagine, you could imagine a pilot program with different counties and that teamed up with researchers. I mean, we've done that in the past in other areas. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, all right. Well, thank you very much. Um, uh, please know that if any ideas come up, either you know today, tomorrow, next year, we really appreciate your time, your thoughts. Please, you know, continue to stay in touch with me and our staff. We really appreciate your time, and um, I hope to continue the conversation with all of you in different places. Great. All right. Thank, thank you. So much. Um, thank we're you. We're going to take a ten-minute break uh, before our next panel. So can everybody come back to their desks at 1110?